today, we're continuing week four. We're wrapping up the collection. It's going to be powerful. I believe God is going to continue to speak. Uh, I want to kind of go full circle today. We started week one with this text from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If we can go there, can we throw that up on the screen? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says this. It says Paul is talking, and he's speaking to the Corinthian church. He's talking to them about the Macedonia, a few churches in Macedonia, which is a Roman province. It says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. I love this text. Paul talks about the crazy, scandalous, illogical, makes no sense generosity of, the, uh, of this group of churches in this Roman province of Macedonia. You know what's crazy, though, is we actually know one of the churches that participated. The fa- in fact, we know the church that Paul is primarily talking about when he talks about the churches in Macedonia. Do you know what church it is? It's the Philippian church. It's the Philippian church. And, and I want uh, we know this, and, and scholars have, you know, we can look at the book of Philippians and all of that and piece it together. Paul also talks about it in the book of Romans. But I want to go to the book of Philippians really quick. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Again, if not, it's going to be on the screen. That's totally fine. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. So they, they had this severe test of affliction, but they had this abundance of joy. They had nothing, but they gave in a wealth of generosity. They just, they begged Paul. Paul's like, guys, I don't think you should give. You really don't have much. Like, you're very, very, like, you're, you're hurting on cash right now. Like, don't give. Keep it to yourself. But they're like, no, Paul, we want to give. We want to participate. And I love what happens. This beautiful thing happens happens. And it's what I want to focus on today. Uh, We'll read a a few scriptures and we'll really zero in on it. Philippians chapter one, verse three to five. Paul says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership, because of your partnership in the gospel, partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now let's jump to the back of Philippians, the last chapter, Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says this, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. No church entered into partnership with me, partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Today, I want to talk about partnership. The title of my message is The Possibilities of partnership. I really want to zero in, hone in, uh, zoom into this idea of partnership. The Philippian church, who was this church that was in severe affliction, they were in poverty. They partnered with Paul in the gospel. This word partnership, it's this Greek word koinonia. It means fellowship. But what it actually means when you look a little deeper, it's a practical fellowship. It's a financial fellowship. It means we're going to support you financially. It really means this. Hey, Paul, you're going around and you're spreading the, the news of Jesus. We're going to fund that for you. We're going to become your partner in the gospel. And we're going to help you get to where you need to go. We're going to make sure you got a place to sleep at night. We're going to make sure that you have as much as you need. And as you go to all these places, if you see Jerusalem's in trouble, yeah, we're going to give to that and make sure that you can help them and, and support them. We're just, we're just going to give so the message of the gospel can go forth. This idea of partnership. So the Philippian church was one of the churches in the Roman province of Macedonia that partnered with Paul. And even deeper in this idea of partnership is we get to partner with each other. We get to partner with ministers and pastors and leaders who are doing incredible things around the world. And as a church, by the way, we have a number of strategic partnerships right here in Winnipeg, across Canada, all over the world. Um, And it's incredible what God has allowed us to do and the people he's allowed us to partner with. But we also get to partner with Jesus. We get to partner with the Holy Spirit every single day to see the kingdom expand, to see the population of heaven increase, to see people impacted by the most life-changing message on the planet, which is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. One of my favorite stories in all of scripture. I'm so excited because today I get to share with you one of my top favorite stories in all of the Bible. And next week I get to share with you my number one favorite story in all of the Bible. I'm so excited. It's going to be a great two weeks. But anyways, Matthew chapter 14 verse 13 to 21. I've talked about this before, 
uh, a few different moments. Uh, you might be familiar with this story, but Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 to 21. I want to read this text, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk about it together. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. 5,000 men, not including women and children. Such an incredible story. Such a beautiful moment in scripture. So much to unpack. Let's pray before we do. God, thank you so much that we can be here today. It's been said, but we're just grateful for the opportunity to gather considering uh, everything going on in our world and the climate we find ourselves in. Uh, This pandemic uh, rages on, but your kingdom continues to expand and grow. God, you continue to speak and move. God, even just now in this moment, I'm just so grateful that we're here today that along the way people have been impacted and as we continue to move forward as a church, people will continue to uh, be impacted. God, I thank you for every, uh, every heart. I thank you for every person who's tuning in to our service today. And God, I just pray that you would speak and move and have your way in our hearts and in our lives. God, we need you so bad. We need you so desperately. And so we invite you to do a work in our lives and may this word today fall on good soil and would it transform our lives, would it change us forever. Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, we lay our lives down to you, and we just want to receive what you have to say today. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I love group projects. In school, I love group projects. Do we have any group project people at HQ? Everyone's shaking their head. They don't like group projects. In the chat, let us know if you are a group project kind of person. There are really two kinds of, I love these generalizations, by the way. Like, there's two kinds of people in the world. But there really are two kinds of people in the world when it comes to group project. There, there are those like me who love them. And then there's no one in the middle. There is no middle ground. Like, ah, it depends. But like, it's like they loathe them. So everyone here at HQ apparently loathes group projects. But I love them so much. For me, Way less about the project, way more about the social life, way more about the activity, the opportunity to come together and be with people. And uh, if you could, here's the thing about me and group projects. If you could find the right task for me to do, man, I was your best teammate. I was your best partner. But if you asked me to like write the essay, if you asked me to do something I didn't enjoy, you know, I understand why some people loathe group projects. It was because of people like me. But you had to work with me. You had to figure me out. And the 12-year-old version of you couldn't figure that out quite yet. But I love group projects so much. I find them so exciting, so fun to figure out. For me, even now, life, life to me really is just a giant group project. And it's like, okay, well, like we've been assigned to this thing. And uh, you can't quit. You can't go anywhere, so you might as well just figure out how to do the project, how to do this thing called life. But there was this time in Bible college where I got partnered up for a group project. At the time, we weren't dating. We weren't married. We were just friends with Roberta. We got partnered up. This was the one time we had to do a group project together. It was for one of our uh, youth ministry classes, and our, our prof just matched us up. We got paired together, and we had to do a presentation on youth culture. Now, Roberta, I think at this point, would never voluntarily do a group project with me ever again. So we come together and we say, okay, we're going to, this is our angle, this is our topic, this is what we're going to discuss. And I was like, okay, great. So I was like, Roberta, if you want to do the initial research, that would be great. So she went and she did the initial research. Then she sent it to me. She was like, hey, do you want to add anything? I respond to her. I remember so vividly in this email responding to her, hey, if you want to just take a second look at this, 
I sent this back to her. If you just want to take a second look at this, send it back to me and I'll edit it. But hey, don't worry. I'll find a great commercial that we can show the class uh, to really capture the essence and the heart and the spirit of this group project. So off to work, I went really, really like searching through the depths of YouTube, trying to find an amazing commercial that both entertained our class, but got this really, really important message across about youth culture, while Roberta did all of the work, all of the work. And it was so funny because, and I, by the way, I didn't do this intentionally. Like, I'm not a bad person. Back then, I wasn't like aware of these things in my life, and I wasn't necessarily aware of group dynamics like this. I'm much better now. I said this before, but like you're you're so lucky. Like the the ten years ago version of me is not your pastor. Like God has done a work. He's done a miracle in my life. It is profound, and I am just grateful. But um, I remember the day we had to like go and present this, and I, I'm almost like embarrassed to admit that like Roberta did the whole thing. You know. So we get up and we're ready to do the group project. And there was a table at the front and, and a couple of chairs. And I literally walked up and the whole entire group project while we're presenting, I sat behind the table at a chair while Roberta stood on the other side in front of the table and the chair. I think I had a quick opening line. Hey everyone, thanks so much. Our group project is about this part of youth culture. Uh, and now here's Roberta. And Roberta did a 20 minute presentation. <laughs> she shared about youth culture and then she looked at me, hit it. And then I hit play on my computer, and we showed the commercial, and it was incredible. It was a great project. I really feel like my commercial bit like really wrapped it all together, really brought it together. It was the cherry on top. It was amazing. But in life, here's what I've come to realize, that life is full of various opportunities and moments to partner. Life is a series of partnerships. Now, whether you like group projects or not is completely irrelevant because life is full of of partnerships. You think about relationships, right? A married couple, that's a partnership. You think about being friends, that's a partnership. You think about the relationship with your kids, that's a partnership. You think about having employees or colleagues or employers, there's a partnership. So in all these different areas and facets of life, we have the opportunity to partner together. And some might be great partnerships. It's really important to make sure you have the right partners in life. The wrong partner can really cause a lot of problems in your life, i.e. me and Roberto with that specific project, but it can get a lot worse than that. But I think a partnership that we fail to recognize is in our walk with, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, and we don't really understand the premise of our relationship with God is through this idea of partnership. Do you know that God wants to partner with you? And God wants you to partner with him. And here's the thing, discipleship is doing what God has told you to do. And partnership is being invited into doing what only God can do. Discipleship is God saying, hey, I want you to do this. And you say, yes, Lord, I'm your disciple. I'm your apprentice. I'm your child. I'm your follower. I will do that. But partnership is this really amazing invitation that God has given us to actually do things that we could never do in our own strength, that we could never do in our own power. And God actually invites us in and calls us to do things that are literally, physically, in every way impossible for us to do, but not for him. And so I want to talk today about this idea of partnership, the possibilities of partnership. And if we can understand not just our discipleship, not just being obedient, but the wide open spacious life that God is calling us and inviting us into to partner, to live in step with the Holy Spirit, it will change and mark our lives and our church forever. And I'm not just being extreme. I'm not just exaggerating it. I truly believe with all of my heart that this concept, this idea will change our very lives. To illustrate this idea, to really bring it to life, Matthew chapter 14 uh, is the text I want to land on and, and, and talk about. Just to give you a little context before we start walking through this text, right before this moment happens, Jesus actually receives word that his cousin and the prophet John the Baptist has just been killed. He literally just received word that his cousin, this incredible man who he loved and favored, believed in, thought high of, had just been killed murdered in the most gruesome of ways. He had been beheaded. Jesus gets word, and he, he needs a moment. He needs to escape. So what does he do? He leaves, and he goes to a desolate place, a place where there are no people. People catch wind that Jesus has left, and so they start following him. And he actually crossed a, a, a body of water, and the people actually walked around the body of water to get to him. 
And as they do this, Jesus senses something in them. And he has compassion on them. He's like, man, I'm not really in a great space right now. I don't really want to be around people right now. I need to get away. I need to pray. I need to process. My cousin, John the Baptist, has just been killed. But the people come. And this is kind of the, this is being a leader. Sometimes you don't feel like it. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but we're all leaders. But sometimes as a leader, you don't get to walk away. You don't get to run away. You don't get to stop leading. Jesus in this moment wanted to take a break, but he he couldn't because the people needed him. They come to him and he has compassion on them. And the Bible tells us, Matthew, the author of this text, tells us that Jesus started healing their sick and he started doing ministry. And there's this massive crowd. So many people start coming to Jesus. Word is beginning to spread. And this always happens to Jesus. People find out his location and everyone just sends the ping, you know, just like here's where he is. Drop the pin. This is where Jesus is. Come quick. So people are just rushing to where Jesus is. So much compassion. And he just starts healing all the sick. And he starts doing ministry. The disciples in verse 15, they recognize that it's the end of the day. And so this is what happens. It says, now it was evening. And the whole day Jesus has been doing ministry. The whole day Jesus has been healing. The whole day people, Jesus has been connecting with people. But now it was evening. And the di- disciples came to Jesus and they said, this is a desolate place. And the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Send the people away because the day is over and they're hungry because they've been getting healed all day and sitting all day and learning all day and we're hungry and you're hungry. Send them away. We need to go and buy food for themselves. And really, I just want to take a moment to point out something here. We live in a world right now where it's made, we're made to believe that every problem is our problem. And I think so much of our anxiety comes from feeling like every problem is our problem. And we have to have an opinion, and we have to have a solution, and we have to have a response to every single issue. Can I tell you that that's not true? Social media, our phones have created this pathway to the latest news, the the most recent content, the, the latest chaos and tragedy, and all of these things. You're walking and you're grocery shopping, and then you get an alert on your phone, this just happened. You're sitting with your friends, and you go on Instagram really quick, and you see that this has happened. And we're made to believe that every single issue and every single problem is our problem. And we feel this anxiety, this tension that we need to do something about it, and it's just not true. We were never meant to carry the world, and we were never created to hold the world up. Jesus is God. He is in charge. But I do want to say this. If you notice a problem and it stirs in your heart, that is your problem. So not every problem is your problem, but the ones that do something in your heart, the ones that you become aware of are your problem. The things in this world that make you uncomfortable, those, that's your problem. And I believe that God is going around into all of our lives and he's pointing out things and he's highlighting things and he's illuminating things in our lives that are problems for us to begin to address, for us to pray about, not for us to tell the world to pray about and do something about, but for us to take responsibility. That's not what this message is about, but I just wanted to throw that in there because the disciples recognize a problem and they don't want to do anything about it. But the reason they recognize this problem in the first place is because God wanted to partner with them to do something about it. He wanted to reveal to them the possibilities of partnership. Let's go on in verse 16. It says, but Jesus said, so that Jesus sent them away so they can go get food. But Jesus said, they don't need to go away. They don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. They identified a problem. And Jesus, his response is this. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And I love this. This is what an invitation into partnership looks like. This is the invitation. This is the moment. These are the kind of things that God will speak to our spirits and speak in our heart, and he'll just drop it on us. We'll be like, oh my gosh, these people are hungry. Someone should do something. No, 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 no. You begin to pray about it. You begin to do something about it. You begin to think about it. You begin to give to that thing. Don't send them away. This is on you. I've, I've illuminated this in your mind. I've, 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 uh, I've revealed this to you. I've shown you this problem so you can begin to do something about it. Don't send them away. This isn't on them. This is on you. I want you to do something about it. I want you to give them something to eat. This is an invitation. What we've got to recognize is the invitations of partnership, the possibilities of partnership. Again, we can't do them on our own. There are over 5,000 people here. 
There are 12 disciples. There is no time, there is no money for them to be fed. The very premise of this is irrational. Jesus is like, what are you doing? Are you, are you kidding? You actually want to, wait, uh, we, we have to? Could you imagine the confusion? I would be like, what in the world is going on? Jesus said, do you want to sit, do you need some water? Like, we can't feed these people. There's just, there's over 5,000 of them. Some scholars predict anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people. And Jesus is like, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. Has God ever asked you to do something impossible? Has God ever put something on your heart that seems so scary and so daunting that you, you thought you'd fail? And you're like, God, I can't even, where do I even, what do I, how does this, like, you're just confused? This is the invitation of partnership. This is a beautiful invitation to the kind of life that Jesus wants us to have. Verse 17 says this. We see the reluctance. We see the reality of the disciples. So Jesus is like, come and partner with me. They say, oh, we, we would love to, Jesus, but we only have five loaves here and two fish. And we know from other accounts in the, in the Gospels that it was actually not the disciples who had this food, these five loaves and two fish. It was a young boy who brought it to them and said, I have this bagged lunch. I have the snack that my mom sent me with. I've got five loaves and two fish, but you can use it to, to continue to do ministry. So they say to him, well, we only have five loaves and two fish. And this is the human pattern. This is what we often do. We get invited into something daunting. We get invited into something impossible. We get invited into something scary. Go and feed these 5,000 people. And here's our response. Well, we only have five loaves and two fish. We only have. We only have. And we as human beings, God invites us into this incredible, wild adventure of a life. And our response is this. I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I don't have the ability. And we come up with all of these excuses. And a lot of them are valid. God, I just... I don't know how I'm going to make time with all with my job and I got kids and family and the side project. I'm just trying to pay the bills, Jesus. And I want to, I want to sow into that, but I just, I just, I just don't have enough. I just don't have enough. And that's the point. That's the point. Because the idea of partnership is not that you would do it in your own strength. Not that you would take all that you have and do incredible miracles with it. The idea here wasn't that the disciples would say, oh yeah, we brought, we brought a, a, a bunch of food. We were prepared for this moment. We've been saving all year and we called the caterer and they drove the food trucks up. We got, we got six different options and varieties. The idea is not that we would be prepared for the possibilities of partnership or that we could do it in our own strength and our own ability is that God is inviting us in to do things that we cannot do the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us why would you want to live and operate in your own strength when when the God of resurrection power is saying hey I live in you and I want to do incredible miracles in and through your life it's not about what it's not about not enough it's not about what I don't have Jesus, in response to, we only have five loaves and two fish, in verse 18, he says this. He says, bring them here to me. And this is the power of partnership. This is where it all culminates. The audacious ask of Jesus. The looking at our hands and saying, I just don't have enough. I would love to. I would want to. I kind of have a little bit of faith to believe it, but I just don't have enough. In God's response, every time he calls us to do something that we cannot do in our power, you know what he says? Bring it to me. God, I don't have enough money. Just bring it to me. God, I don't have enough talent. Well, just, just bring it to me. Because God, here's the crazy thing, God is not, Jesus in this moment is not actually asking them to feed 5,000 people. He's asking them to partner with him. And together, they will feed 5,000 people. Come and be in relationship. Come and be in partnership with me. Bring it to me. 
But God, I just don't feel like I'm good enough. Yeah, but bring it to me. But God, I've just only been doing this for like a year. I don't have a lot of experience. Like, like, like Sean Quigley has way more experience than me. No, he's like, just, just bring it. Bring it to me. Bring me what you do have. We're so caught up in what I don't have. Oh, God, maybe, maybe. Okay, God, you want me to feed 5,000 people? Okay, let me save. I'll start saving right now. No, 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 no. Don't wait. Generosity starts today. Partnership starts today. You can make a difference and an impact today. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Verse 19. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven. Let's pause here for a moment. He looked up to heaven. The moment where the material where the earthly, let me say it this way. Until what is in our hands has been connected to heaven, it does not have any power to make an impact. In this moment, Jesus takes what the disciples have collected, the five loaves and two fish. And at this point, it's still just five loaves and two fish. It's been surrendered. And in the surrendering, it gets connected into heaven. Jesus looked up to heaven and he said a, blessing the whole idea of partnership is that heaven and earth would be merged together that our not enough in partnership with heaven becomes more than enough I don't have enough but I've surrendered it and now the supernatural takes place and whoa look out because God's about to do something incredible you know what this is this is stewardship as opposed to ownership. I told you it's coming full circle. We started with this concept and we're ending with this concept because this is the whole idea. What I have is not mine. And if I wanna partner with God, if I wanna see him do miracles, I need to give it to him so it can touch heaven and God can begin to do incredible, miraculous things with it. I cannot feed 5,000 people. You cannot feed 5,000 people. The disciples could not feed 5,000 people, but are not enough. Partnered with heaven is more than enough. He looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. You know what I love is Jesus could have just started handing out the basket full of food. He gave it back to the disciples. This is partnership. Jesus is like, you play your part and I'll play mine. Take what's in your hands, give it to me, surrender it, let it become supernatural, let it become heaven, uh, mixed with heaven, let it imp- you know, combine with heaven. He gives it back to us and that we get to make an impact in the world. Verse 20 says this, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over. Five loaves and two fish. And after everyone ate and everyone was satisfied, they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men. Besides women and children. Not enough. Not enough. This is all we have. Becomes and they all ate. And we're satisfied. You know who ate? The crowd ate. And the disciples ate. And they were all satisfied. They were all full and there was leftovers. So often when it comes to giving, when it comes to releasing and surrendering surrendering our resource, one of the reluctancies that we have, one of the hesitations is like, oh, if I give what I have to eat, then I won't get to eat. They'll eat, but I won't eat. No. No. Those who partner with God always have provision. Those who surrender and release to God and say, God, it's not enough, but I know you can make it more than enough. They always have leftovers. They always have something to eat. As you make room in your life, giving in the kingdom of God is not giving, it is getting. You are making room in your life for God to continue to bless you. There's so much fear in this area. I get it in the economy and everything. It's just so uncertain. It's I got to hang on because I got to eat. Those who partner with God always have provision. There is always leftovers. The disciples ate, the crowd ate, everyone ate. 
the possibilities of partnership. Let's do something right now as we, as we, as we close. Can we just kill the chat? I know that's like online pastor, like uh, online church, like 101. Keep the chat going. Stop typing in the chat. Don't get distracted. If you're going to amen, amen in your head or uh, oh loud, just don't type it in the chat. Let's take a moment to really consider what's happening in this text and what God is doing in our church right now. Because we are being invited in to partner with Jesus. The possibilities are endless. Stories like this are what our lives should look like. And I'm not saying we're going to walk around and feed crowds of people, but miracles. I believe God is inviting our church into miracles. The supernatural. The profound. So many of us, we settle for a good life and God's like, no, I want you to have a great life. So many of us settle for following the rules and God's like, no, I want to actually do life with you. I want to partner with you. I want to call you to crazy things. I want you to have testimonies. I want you to know that when I ask you to do something crazy and it seems stupid, it is, but it's not because I'm in it. On your own, yeah, you can't do it, but with me, all things are possible. Do you know God wants us to live a life of the impossible? He makes the impossible possible. And he wants to invite us into a life full of miracles that our church would experience this very idea They all ate and they were satisfied. What would it look like for us as a church to say today I am partnering with Jesus. Today I am taking my version of the five loaves and two fish and I'm giving it to God and I might be reluctant, I might be afraid, I might be full of fear. It feels like it's not enough, but I'm saying, God, okay, if you say you could use it, I'll trust you, and, and I just want to see you move. What would it look like if every single person in our church became a partner with the Holy Spirit? What if every single person in our church became a partner like the Philippian church with Paul? It was like, no, we're not just going to be friends. We're not just going to talk to each other and be in fellowship. No, we're going to be in fellowship with a purpose. We're going to be friends with, 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 with a mission. We're going to fund this thing. We're going to give. We're going to sow to see people's lives transformed and changed. Friends, I got to tell you, if I were to begin to share all the vision that God has put in my heart, it would overwhelm you. God has called us as a community to so much. But it will not happen until we have decided as a church that we will be partners. I love it when we partner because God gets the glory. People's lives are impacted and our lives get bigger on the inside. Everyone's impacted from generosity. But we actually have a real moment in history to impact the world. We can serve our city, our province, our country, our world. And it starts with partnership. It starts today us saying, you know what, God, I just lay it down. Here's my $10. You know this story is about resource. And every miracle has something material. Here's my, here's my 50 bucks. Here's my $12. I don't have a lot of time to serve, but I got an hour. I got 45 minutes. I don't really know that area too well, but I'll try and I'll, I'll learn. God, I'm just, I'm just giving you what I have to make a difference in the world. Because church, I just believe that God is calling us to see miracles like this on a daily, on a weekly, on a monthly basis. And just what would it look like if we all became partners? The possibilities are endless. God has given us a mandate as a church to reach our city, to create partnerships in our city. What would it actually look if we made it our goal that people in our city wouldn't go hungry anymore? What if we just started attacking the the diseased parts of our city, poverty, the parts of our city that are decaying, the parts of the city that we look at 
but we know it's not okay. Homelessness. We said as a church, we're going to partner, because we can't do it on our own, but we sure can partner with God and we can try to start making a difference and see him do the miraculous. What would it look like for us as a church to begin to invest in the next generation? To just come together. The possibilities are endless. What would it look like for us to one day have our own building, our own facility that we could invite people into to continue to share the message of Jesus? What would it look like one day as we partnered together to have multiple buildings? What would it look like for us to plant churches all over Canada and not just rose churches? but just support church planters and people trying to make a difference, trying to bring the gospel to our country? What would it look like for us to have enough resource as a church to bring on more people, to increase what we're doing as a church? What would it look like to one day, as we partner together, hire a children's pastor and worship pastors and campus pastors and creative pastors and and different staff and support? so we can continue to serve you and serve our city well. All of these things happen because of partnership. Quite literally, the possibilities are endless. And here's what I don't want to happen right now. I'm going to close in just a moment, and we're going to just continue to worship and allow God to continue to speak to us. If if I could just share my heart for a moment. I love the idea of impacting the world. It drives me, our church is built on it. But here's what I care most about in this topic about giving and generosity and partnership. It's you. I'm so excited to make an impact as a church. I'm so excited to one day cut that red ribbon of the grand opening of our first 10th, 20th facilities. I'm so excited for our team to grow and continue to serve our city. I'm excited to open uh, dream centers one day where we can just serve our city in various ways. Like that, again, the possibilities are endless. I'm so excited for those things. What I'm so excited about is your relationship with Jesus. And what keeps me up at night and what causes me to do a whole collection on this is is you. Because let me just be completely honest for a moment. When I think about those in our church who don't give, my immediate thought is, oh, so they're missing out on incredible partnership opportunity with Jesus. They're missing out on miracles. They're missing out on testimonies. They're missing out on on creating an impact in the world that will ripple throughout history and they won't have any clue about it until they get to heaven and they see, oh, that's what I got to be a part of. It's you. This whole thing, it's actually about you and Jesus. And it's a bonus. It's incredible that we get to make a difference in the world. But as a pastor, I'm committed and I'm devoted to you. Money talks are awkward and uncomfortable, but I'm willing to have them because I care more about you than being a little uncomfortable. And so here's what I want to challenge you. Here's what I want to encourage you in today. Start partnering with Jesus. Bring your five loaves and two fish. The message of God today is bring it to me. You don't have to do the feeding. You don't have to do the miracle. You just have to surrender it. Bring your five loaves. Bring your two fish. He'll take it. He'll touch heaven with it. And he'll continue to resource you so you can resource others. He'll continue to bless you so you can bless others the possibilities of partnership worship team why don't you come on up I want to pray for us as we wrap up this collection let us not miss a moment let us not miss an opportunity let us not miss an invitation from Jesus to partner with him a wide open spacious life awaits you being big on the inside awaits you having joy beyond measure awaits you being content awaits you having peace awaits you comes down to partnership with Jesus. Let me pray for you, God. Thank you so much that you did not just set the world into motion and walk away. That you are involved in every detail of our lives. You care about every detail of our lives. 
and that Christianity and following you is not just rules and rituals, regulations, do the right thing, say the right thing. No, it is more than that. It's about being in step with your spirit. It's about a partnership, a real relationship where every day you call us into impossible things that scare us, that freak us out. But you don't expect us to do the hard part. You do the hard part. You just want us to say yes. God, I pray today that our response as a church would be yes. Yes to everything you're asking us to do. Yes to everything you're asking us to give. Yes to every place you're telling us to go. God, would you help us to become partners in every sense of the word? That like the Philippian church who partnered with Paul, we would just give and we would sow to see the gospel go forth. God, would you help us to overcome our fear today? I know so many in our church want to partner. Like right now, they're like praying. God, help me to get there. God, would you help them to get there? Would you meet them in that spot? Would you help them to figure out the financial side? Would you help them to figure out the time, all of the things that hold them back? God, would you speak to their not enough and just show them that they're not enough mixed with heaven is more than enough. God, would we never try to do it on our own? But would we just desire and seek to partner? God, would our ears hear what our eyes see what you're trying to do in us in our church in our city and beyond god i declare today in jesus name that the enemy no longer has a stronghold over the finances over the money over the resource over the wallets of those who call rose church home that for years they've been made to believe that their money is theirs and that all the pressure and all the weight is on them, that they need to figure it out. God, I pray today, I declare that we are stewards and managers, not owners. God, I know the enemy has been attempting to halt the partnership of your people because the enemy does not want us to give because he knows that it'll impact eternity, that what we give here and now matters in the next life. God, I pray for a church that would work hard to be generous, God, I know it's, it's hard to get and it's even harder to give, but I pray as your spirit leads us that we would get excited about the possibilities of partnership and we would lay it down at your feet so you could do what only you can do and that our relationship with you would just grow and we would become large on the inside, big on the inside. God, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, love you, church. Let's continue to worship.